If you would turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. we're talking about today why the Bible is our authority. And we'll be in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Verse 17, so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. So I hope as we look at scripture that we have an appreciation for it. And I hope that we realize that scripture is the greatest treasure that we have. Now, obviously apart from God himself, um, but scripture is his very word, his uh, self-revelation. Uh, they are words from God revealed to us um, from him. God has revealed himself in the very book that we have that we call scriptures. And when you read the words of the Bible, you're reading the very words out of the mouth of God. And so I hope that this is something that you cherish because it says all scripture verse 16, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, if you're jotting down some notes uh, this evening, and um, I just want us to see first that the Bible is our authority because it was inspired by God. So why is it our authority? It's because it was inspired by God. Look at what it says in verse 16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God. What does that mean? Well, hold your finger here, and we're going to turn over real quick to Hebrews chapter 1. Just two books forward, um, Hebrews chapter 1. And um, in, in Hebrews chapter 1 and in verse 1, it says, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now, what we see here is that God spoke on two occasions. He spoke once long ago, and he speaks in these last days. Uh, he's and as he's speaking here in this passage, he's he's talking about the Old Testament and New Testament revelation. This is what we have in the Bible, and so he says, "God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, and in many ways, uh, God spoke long ago uh, to the Jewish fathers. That's what he's talking about, and he spoke to those fathers by means of the prophets." Well, how did he speak to them? The, the verse tells us in two ways, in many, in many portions and in many ways. Now, what does he mean in many portions? Well, it basically means it was revealed in different pieces. Everything wasn't revealed to one prophet, but one received one portion of revelation and another, another portion of revelation. Then it also says that he spoke in many ways. This means uh, God did not communicate the same way with all the prophets. He had many different ways. He, he, there are many different ways that he thought fit uh, to communicate. And so sometimes it was by a dream, uh, sometimes by visions. Uh, sometimes he used the Urim and the Thummim. Um, sometimes he did that by an audible voice sometimes by legible characters um, under his own hand. We saw an example of that in Daniel. And, and we also see another example when he wrote the Ten Commandments on stone. He wrote that, Numbers 12, 6 to 8. He said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, 
I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream, not so, mu not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant? Why, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? And I, you know, when I read this passage, I think about the, the, the privilege that uh, Moses uh, was blessed to be in uh, with his relationship with the Lord. And so um, he had a very close relationship with the Lord. And so that's one way he spoke. It also means for us that he uh, speaks to us through many books. And so uh, when he says he speaks in, in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, um, in, in many portions, in many ways, he speaks to us today through many books. Um, we have the Pentateuch. Um, we have the prophetic books. We have the historical books. And then we have books of poetry. And, and so what was done then continues now to us because he says in these last days, verse two, he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world. Now, this is how he speaks to us now. The New Testament is God speaking and revealing his son. The Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi is the revelation of God. It is who he is. It shows his attributes. It shows his attitudes. It shows what he's like. It shows what he does. It shows what he tolerates and does not tolerate. It shows how he desires holiness and how he punishes sin. And so he tells us about himself before we meet him in the New Testament. And so the those who say that the New Testament uh, shows a different God, doesn't show a different God. We're told about who he is, and then we, we meet him in the flesh in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And so when we get to the New Testament, we see God revealed through Christ. And so what we have here in our hands is not the word of a man, but the word of God. But notice it says in verse 2 there, in these last days, uh, the time of the Gospels, of the Gospel, these times that we're living in are the last times. It's the last days. This is the time that we're currently living in. The, the, the Gospel revelation is the last. Um, you know, this is the last that we're to expect from God in terms of the Scripture. There's no more Scripture. And so the beauty of, of the Bible and the, and the completed books that we have is that it is final. Nothing is to be added. Uh, we don't have to be kept in suspense. Um, we're not looking for the last testament or the next testament of Jesus Christ. There are no new discoveries, but we can rejoice in the, the completed revelation of, of the word of God that we have in our hands. And so how is it that God used scripture to reveal himself? Second Peter 1.20 tells us, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, some people have suggested that perhaps the best way to uh, translate it would be uh, inspiration. Um, you know, so they might say, know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own ins inspiration. That you know, and if they would translate it that way, they would be saying that scripture does not come out of inspired men. Um, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of origination in one's own mind. No message of scripture comes out of any human source. And that's the idea. But look at how he starts the verse. Um, he says, but know this first of all. He's saying there's one important thing to know first before you start studying scripture. Whether you're a new believer or you're a mature believer, he says, I want you to know that it wasn't made up in our minds. It wasn't in human minds. And so he says in verse 
verse 21, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So scripture is not a product of man. It wasn't made by us. Now the word uh, made in the verse here that's being projected is the word pharaoh, P-H-E-R-O, and it means to bear, uh, to carry along, to convey, to produce, to bring forth, to bring along. And so he's saying no message of scripture, no prophecy of scripture was ever conveyed or brought along or brought forth by an act of human will. It wasn't produced by humans. Instead, how was it done? It tells us it was by the Holy Spirit. And so moved um, in, the, in, the, in the verse there, um, he, has the, he, he says, no prophet scriptures ever made. Um, and I told you that that word is uh, the word Pharaoh, P-H-E-R-O. But then we have uh, the word moved there, and that's the same verb, Pharaoh. And so it was, it was the men that were carried along. It was the men that something was produced. It was in them that something was produced. But it was the Holy Spirit that produced it in them, that carried them along. They were moved by the Holy Spirit to speak from God. And so they didn't move the scripture. They were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the scripture. And so the Holy Spirit filled them um, and they moved along as the Holy Spirit moved them. So it's almost as if these men had sails and the Holy Spirit was blowing the, them along in the direction that he wanted them to go. And so when we think about the content of the Bible, it is revelational. And the process by which that content was written down is called inspiration. And so these, these human authors were in the process, but it didn't originate with them. And it didn't come from them. It didn't come from their desire or their will. They were used as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So when you pick up a Bible and you read it, uh, despite what some people will say, you are you're not reading the word of men, you're reading the word of God, but it was written down by men who were moved along in the process by the power of the Holy Spirit, not apart from their personalities. And that's one of the things that makes the Bible neat. You know, it's not apart from their personalities. It's not apart from their experiences, not apart from their vocabulary. And so God used their personalities, experiences, and vocabulary in that. And so God spoke, it says in Hebrews, in the Old Testament, to the fathers um, by the prophets in many ways and in many portions. And God has spoken in the New Testament by his son in the Gospels, and then about his son in the rest of the New Testament. And this wonderful process is what we call inspiration. And, and Jeremiah, if you, you know, is a, is a good illustration of this process. He said, we see in Jeremiah 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God. Behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. And then in verse 9, then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. What a tremendous statement uh, we see there from the Lord uh, to Jeremiah. He says, I have put my words in your mouth. That was the promise for the writers of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed. All holy writing comes from God. It didn't take long for people to recognize it, but still there, there are some people who say, 
well, the Bible's inspired, but only concepts, not real words. People who think that the writers were inspired by God um, with great religious thoughts, and they wrote it in their own, own words. So we, you know, they'd say we don't really have the words of God. So they would say, don't get bogged down in the words. Just look out for the concepts and go with the ideas, go with the flow, they would say. Don't worry about the words. That's just details. You know, the, the words are just details that get in the way, but it doesn't, you know, and, and this morning, again, I, I spoke about um, Tim Keller and, uh, you know, I was listening to what he was saying about Genesis 1, and he was saying, you know, you know, that's the reason why he doesn't believe Genesis 1 is inspired. It's, it's, it's poetry. It's a song. And, you know, you can't get bogged down in, in Genesis 1. You got to go on to Genesis 2. And if you took Genesis 1 literally, then it would contradict the rest of the Bible. And so people like that will say, don't, don't take this part literally. You know, here's the concept of this part. Here's the thought of this part. Um, don't take the words. But it doesn't make sense when you, if you were to think about things that way, because how can you communicate an idea without using words? <clears throat> Remember when Moses said that he wasn't eloquent, God didn't say to him, I will be with your mind and teach you what to say or, or teach you what to think. He said, I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. Similarly to what uh, we see with uh, Jeremiah here on the screen. He, you know, Isaiah said, if you remember, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and he said, go and tell this people. Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me saying, so it was in words, not thoughts without words. Just like you can't have a tune without notes um, or music without a melody or, or the sun without light, etc. And so that is one kind of attack on the Bible. And there, there are many more that uh, we won't take the time to get into right now. But let's get back to our original text in 2 Timothy 3.16, um, back just over a couple um, uh, books. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And notice, secondly, if you're jotting down some notes, not only is the Bible our authority because it came from God, but it's also intended with a purpose. And so again, we see that in verse 16, that it says it's profitable, and it lists several purposes there. The term profitable, when we look at that, means uh, that it's the purpose, it has an intent for, and it, it's a good intent, it's a positive intent. And so we, we see the words um, here that all scripture is inspired, it's God breathed, and it tells us that it's profitable. Now, the word of God can have fully equip us for every good work. That's some of the things it's profitable for. It's helpful, it's serviceable, it's advantageous. It gives us an advantage. And, and, and it gives us a few of these that we'll look at in a second here, but in verse 17, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It would be one thing if we just had a nice word from God, but we have a life-changing word from God. And as Paul is writing to Timothy here, he wants him to remember the usefulness of the word. It's true. It's good. It's solid. It's from God. And that's why when you get to chapter 4, 
look, just look down at chapter four of, of Second Timothy here. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearance, by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Repro rebuke, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And he continues um, that in verse three about those who wouldn't endure sound doctrine, want their ears tickled and so forth. And so it's because it's a word from God, he could actually say to, 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 to Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season. Use it for what its purpose is. And so that's what we see in verses 16 and 17. And we see several things here that it's useful for. We see that it's teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, equipping for every good work. And so the first one is that its purpose is teaching. Now, obviously, this teaching takes place after salvation um, has occurred. Um, you can't teach doctrine to a non-believer, well, you can try and do it, but it won't have any kind of impact. Um, but 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us why we can't teach that to an uh, unbeliever. It says, the natural man does not accept the things of God, of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And so one has to be saved. But the word teaching that we see here in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 is the word didaskalia. Uh, it's not a process. It is content. It deals with doctrine. It deals with truth that is taught. And so the scripture then is a body of truth, and it, it instructs us in all the truth. What does Jude in verse 3 tell us? to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. And so this is what Jude was talking about He, when he said the faith. He's not talking about the faith that leads to salvation or have faith that everything's going to work out okay. But when we see the terms the faith, he's referring to the body of truth that we see here in the Bible. And that's why we have to make sure that we're being true to this, because it is our body of truth. And so not only is it good for teaching, but we see that its purpose is reproof. The word literally here means to rebuke. Rebuke means to, to confront someone with a, a view towards uh, convicting them of misbehavior. It's to, it's to rebuke someone's misconduct or to rebuke false teaching or error. The word also has a positive ministry in that it builds us up spiritually, but it also has a negative ministry uh, of tearing things down. It, it tears and it shreds the things that deserve to be torn and shredded. So if something is not truth, then the Bible tears it down and it shreds it. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And so in that case, it's calling people back from error. If people are drifting off, the word of God brings them back, up, brings them back into line. And so the idea is that we line up our lives with what scripture says. Why? Uh, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And so the, the, the first you know, rebuking work of the word then is towards sin in the life of a person. And because people don't want to be confronted with sin, what do they do? They accumulate teachers who don't teach about sin. And they teach what these people want to hear. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you've been following what's been going on with the United Methodist Church. And, um, you know, if you really study their history, they kind of came together um, from church splits and they've split before and, and so forth. But um, they are planning a split again. 
And the and everybody could see that coming. You know, I think we could see that coming, especially with what happened with the Presbyterian Church um, some 10, 15 years ago when they split into um, Presbyterian Church of America and Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, of course, the USA branch is the liberal branch. But um, the United Methodist Church had been uh, dealing with this issue of can they ordain uh, gay clergy uh, and can they perform gay marriages? And last year, um, they called together a, a worldwide conference to talk about this. And, and, you know, we in the American church, they have been uh, ordaining gay clergy for years and doing gay marriages for years, going against their book of um, common discipline, I think it's called. Um, but they called together a, a meeting uh, a year ahead of time to vote on the issue. And when it came up for a vote, it was defeated and, and um, that they could not do it, could not perform gay marriages or ordain gay clergy. And the reason why it was defeated was because mainly, I believe, the African uh, wing of the church. And so the American branch wasn't very happy and and um, and so what they've decided to do is to split. And so you'll start to see that split in a couple of years. And what they've said is we'll even give, you know, for those of you who want to go off and be conservative, go be conservative. We'll even give you money. We'll make sure you have the property and, and so on and so forth. And so that's what they've been doing for years is they've been um, accumulating for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And, and we see the result of that because they don't want to hear the word of God. But when the word of God is preached, it is sharp. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as a division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to, to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, the picture here in this verse is a very vivid picture, you know, in that the word of God is like a sword. And this sword is being driven to the core of a person's being. It slices right through and judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so not, you know, the, the actions, but the thoughts and the intentions. And so the word of God then is like a sword that cuts and it cuts deeply. It exposes us. It, it cuts deeply and it reveals our thoughts and intentions of the heart. The next verse says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so we're, we're, we're open to the eyes of him. You know, and and so it, it says that we can't we can't hide. And so then it's the scripture has its purpose. Now notice letter C. It has another purpose for correction. The word correction is the word epen epenorthosis, and um, it means um, a straightening up again. I love that word, um, correction. Or it means a refor reformation or a rectification. But I love that part of straightening up again. You know, if you're crooked or bent over, you know, on doctrine and issues, that's the what the word of God does. And, and that's why it's an authority for us in that it straightens us up again. <clears throat> and so that word is only used here uh, that word epinorthosis. It's only used in this passage and nowhere else in the Bible. And so it's hard for us to, to, to compare its use. But here's the idea. If there's false teaching, then the word of God picks you up and it straightens you up. When we're broken down, it's the thing that we should turn to for help in, in picking up the pieces, you know, as we read the Bible then our sin is exposed and, and we're, we're rebuilt and we get stronger and, and stronger in the process. 
And that's all the work of the word. And so it teaches, it reproves, it corrects. And it also, letter D, its purpose is training in righteousness. What does that training in righteousness mean? Training is the word pahidia, and it means um, a tutorage or education or training. It's it, 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 with the, the, the training, it, it deals with disciplinary correction or, or chastening or chastisement, instruction, nurturing. Uh, you get the idea of training a child. You think about raising a child, you do all of these things. You nurture them, you instruct them, you chasten them, you chastise them, you discipline them. And, and it's a process that goes along um, uh, while the child is in your home. And so um, when we think about educating children, we think about it in this context, we are the children. We're the children of the word. And so the word is able to bring us up. It nurtures us. It raises us up to maturity. And, and, and that can be both a positive and a negative. You know, you think about when you you raise a child, there is positive nurturing, you know, that comes through instruction. And there are negative nurturing that comes through discipline. But both of those, whether it's positive or negative, has the effect of training. And so scripture is sufficient to deal with anything in our life. There's nothing uh, that's left out. Why? Because verse 17, and this could have been a different point um, for um, every good work, verse 17 says, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so we know the man or woman also um, would be equipped because of what scripture does. And so the goal then for us is that we should stop turning to other things that seemingly uh, are authorities for us, whether it's a history book or whether it's our favorite politician or it's somebody else in our lives. We should stop feeding ourselves on the junk of this world and we should stick with what really matters, God's word, because that's our authority.